On the associated argument that one sometimes hears, but not put terribly seriously, I have to say, uh, the nuclear weapons will deter terrorist attacks. I think the answer can be much shorter. Whether or not terrorism can be deterred or whether only prevented and defeated, and whether or not terrorist actors are themselves threatening or using nuclear weapons or explosive devices, nuclear weapons are manifestly neither strategically, tactically or politically necessary or useful for that purpose. Finally, there's the issue which really is a very live one out there that extended nuclear deterrence is necessary to reassure allies. This argument arises particularly, it's also relevant to Russian uh, alliance relationships in the former Soviet Union, but it arises mainly in the context of the United States network of alliances put together in Europe, the Asia Pacific, the Middle East in the 1950s and subsequently which is constructed and has continued to this day on the assumption that the allies in question, including Japan and Australia, were protected by the US nuclear umbrella, not least as a means of ensuring that none of the countries in question were ever tempted to acquire nuclear weapons themselves. There seems no doubt but that for the foreseeable future, Washington's own nuclear deterrent will continue to be extended to its allies to protect them against any nuclear attack or threat that they might experience. The question that's actually more immediately engaging policymakers is whether that extended deterrence should involve the nuclear component of America's deterrent posture being available for non-nuclear threats, be they chemical, biological, cyber, other conventional in character, or whether such threats should be met wholly by non-nuclear means. This issue has yet to be actually resolved for the United States itself, quite apart from its allies. It's currently being addressed in the nuclear posture review, which is due for a presidential decision very early next year. A critical question for that review is whether the US will continue with its current posture, very fiercely articulated under the Bush administration, Bush Jr., um, whether the US will continue uh, with its current posture of strategic ambiguity, which leaves open the possibility of nuclear weapons being used to respond to any class of security threat to itself or its allies, or whether rather it will move, as I for one very much hope it will, toward a declaratory policy that the sole purpose for nuclear weapons, so long as they exist, should be to deter the use by others of nuclear weapons against the US or its allies. The issue is a very complex and sensitive one. On the one hand, there's an overwhelming attraction for all those supporting a nuclear weapon-free world and seeing the United States, along with the other nuclear armed states, making such an unequivocal sole purpose declaration sooner rather than later. This would be a major step forward down the disarmament path and certainly help to put at rest the perception, which is so damaging to the cause of non-proliferation, that the nuclear armed states regard nuclear weapons as an indispensable, legitimate and open-ended guarantor of their own and their allies' security, which they are born to have, but others have no right to acquire. On the other hand, some United States allies argue that their national survival could be put just as much at risk by the use of biological, chemical or indeed large-scale conventional attacks as by nuclear ones and that so long as any such risk is conceivable, they should remain fully protected by the US nuclear umbrella. If the premises of this argument are well founded, the conclusion is of course a compelling one. Clearly again, such allies will need to be very strongly reassured that they won't be exposed to unacceptable risk if the United States changes its posture towards a sole purpose declaration in the way that I've described. I think it's very possible for that assurance, reassurance to be given. There's three kinds of response that suggest themselves. The first is that extended deterrence does not have to mean extended nuclear deterrence. The United States conventional capability, when combined with that of each of the allies in question, constitutes a deterrent to any conceivable aggressor, at least as formidable, frankly, as that posed by nuclear weapons. The second response is that nuclear weapons are simply not as usable as those who focus on their ultimate deterrent utility would like to think of them as being. 
After all, Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy rejected military advice to use nuclear weapons in the Korean War, the Taiwan Straits crisis, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the force of that taboo on the use of such weapons has, if anything, since grown. A third line of response, finally, is that if the United States and all of the allies to whom it extends nuclear deterrence have obligations, as they do, under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to support the total elimination of nuclear arsenals, then it's important that substance be given to that obligation at a time when major efforts are being made to reinvigorate, as I've described, the Non-Proliferation Treaty in all its dimensions, and when so much depends on reducing the salience of nuclear weapons, so much depends on continuing to delegitimize them, great care, I think, has to be taken to allow debate over extended nuclear deterrence uh, to ensure that this doesn't raise their salience in national security policies, particularly when there's no real security threat to NATO or East Asian allies today that justifies inflating the value of nuclear weapons in this way. Well, I hope that I've said enough, not too much, although that's always a risk on a topic as complex as this, to persuade you that the challenge of nuclear disarmament, although a mighty one, can in fact be met and that the Australia-Japan Commission can make a significant contribution to advancing the cause by getting all the relevant issues and arguments on the table, doing so in a way that is both idealistic and realistic, and helping to energise through our analysis and our advocacy the high-level debate the world now has to have, whether or not it's realised and accepted that. The trick will be to generate and sustain momentum at at least three different levels, top-down from the United States and Russia, peer group from the UN and other, sorry, through the UN and other multilateral forums because so many other international players have to deliver as well on all this stuff, and also bottom-up, mobilising all those sources of civil society action and commitment, not very much heard of on the nuclear issue for several decades now, but which are certainly capable of keeping governments focused and honest and engaged. In all this advocacy effort, there is just one little mantra first articulated by the Canberra Commission in 1996, which I think captures the issues more succinctly than anything else and is worth repeating to anyone who will listen anytime, anywhere. It has a simplicity and a resonance, which I think Stephen Murray Smith would have appreciated, and let it be my last word this evening. So long as any state has nuclear weapons, others will want them. So long as any such weapons remain, it defies credibility that they will not one day be used by accident, miscalculation, or design. And any such use would be catastrophic for our world as we know it. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to respond to your question. Any questions? Yeah. We have Mike. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, my question is about the nuclear weapons that have been used in recent years, um, depleted uranium munitions. Um, what are their exact legality, and is there anything in the non-proliferation treaty to cover them? I don't believe there are. You depleted uranium weapons have got a particular hardness about them, as I understand, which, which makes them particularly useful militarily or perceived to be useful in sort of bunker busting type operations, breaching you know, heavily reinforced uh, armaments. Um, I'm still learning my way on a lot of this technical stuff, so I might be wrong about that. I don't understand there to be any constraints about that. There is an issue. Um, certainly an issue about littering the landscape with bits and pieces of radioactive material following from this. But I don't think it raises the same sort of issues as the nuclear weapons as such raise. I mean, depleted uranium doesn't have anything like a sort of explosive uh, destructive capability that adds anything to conventional armaments, just has that particular uh, utility. So it's more an environmental issue when those weapons are being used in various places. They've tended to leave the landscape pretty scarred and pretty ugly and pretty unusable in some respects. Uh, but that's a different kind of issue from the one that I've been addressing. I think my agenda is big enough without me adding that one as well. Yeah. 
Um, sorry, over there. Um, in um, the lead up to the last elections in 2007, your former adviser Martin Letts wrote that an incoming government in Australia should consider reviewing whether there are contingencies where Australia might develop nuclear weapons. Do you agree with that or do you think that there's a role in non-weapon states like Australia and Japan making formal pledges that they will never develop nuclear weapons as a contribution to the abolition movement? Well, I certainly think there is not only utility but a necessity to make uh, that kind of pledge. And I think um, Martin, who was having the occasional heavy-duty realist moment at various stages of uh, her career, would probably uh, want to step back a bit um, from that statement now. Um, she's actually still advising this commission. She's a brilliant researcher on a whole bunch of uh, stuff. She's working specifically on civil nuclear energy side. But I don't, I don't think that's a, that's a position that is simply credible. I mean, one of the great things that I think one finds as one moves around is there's very little military enthusiasm for having nuclear weapons. I mean, they're not perceived as militarily useful in any kind of war fighting scenario. They create impassable terrain, they create huge sorts of you know, problems. They're not useful for traditional capturing territory. They're not useful in the sort of you know, smaller scale conventional wars that have been common around the place. And, Congo and Afghanistan and elsewhere ever since. And frankly, for most military people, apart from the real old die-hard shell bags, um, you know, they cause you know, far more trouble than they're worth. And um, I don't think they're perceived as having any uh, role, other than you still get this sort of, um, it's, it's, there's obviously a perception by some small countries or people that feel particularly vulnerable at regime change being forced upon them, North Korea and so on, um, that uh, you know, there is some real utility in, in having this to, to spook a potential aggressor, but um, it's very difficult to, to see, as I'm trying to say, uh, try to spell out any actual real-world scenario in which uh, it would be likely to make a difference. So should we make such a pledge? A pledge not to acquire? Well, I mean, I would hope that's certainly implicit in what's been said uh, publicly, but let's make it explicit by all means. I mean, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any difficulty with that. I mean, and I think nor would the, uh, nor would the Australian government. Um, you know, acquiring civil nuclear energy capability is a, a different kettle of fish altogether, and I don't think there's too many people want to make pledges of that kind these days, but nuclear weapons, no, that's, we're trying to go in the other direction. Okay, um, anyone over there? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gareth. I met recently in New York City with Evans Revere, who's a former US uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and he told me that um, in regards to the North Korean issue, uh, China, um, for one, doesn't want a pro -American, another pro-American capitalist state on its borders, but at the same time also doesn't want a nuclear state on its borders. Given that China is the last thing that, or the closest thing that uh, North Korea has to a friend, what role, if any, do you believe that China should be playing in um, helping to disarm North Korea? Thank you. That's an old chestnut that all that's necessary to keep Kim Jong-il in line is for Beijing to sit on his head. Um, it's not as simple as that. I mean, every Chinese I've ever talked to on this, I've got one on my commission, former very senior diplomat, and spent a lot of time in Beijing and elsewhere. They say with some degree of credibility there are actually limitations on the, on the influence they can wield, and these guys um, just you know, drive them nuts trying to uh, you know, work out what their next moves are, are going to be. And, uh, and that, if anything, it tends to be, they tend to be <laughs> counter-suggestible um, if, uh, if Beijing gets, gets too heavy. So the notion that there's any easy sort of relationship there, that all they have to do is sort of you know, pick up the phone and make clear that, um, that you know, the, uh, the food support would be chopped off or the energy support would be chopped off and that would bring uh, North Korea to heel. Um, it's, it's not the way the, the world sort of works. I mean, it is the case that China very much fears an implosion in North Korea, a flood of refugees across the border, but so does everybody um, in the region. Nobody wants to see a uh, complete breakdown of that kind occurring, and that's the best, I mean, best guarantee, really, that Kim Jong-il has, that, I mean, nobody is going to do anything stupid. I mean, nobody likes his regime very much, to put it mildly, but the notion of taking the risk of a head-on attack just to, you know, to turn it over in that way is, is inconceivable. So I, th I think we'll actually get there at the end of the day um, with North Korea. There's been a long history, and I've been involved in some of those negotiations back wearing my foreign minister hat, in which the North Koreans have, have come you know, periodically 
you know, to the table and showing themselves quite willing to engage in a sort of rational negotiation, and every now and again it gets very irrational indeed. It did certainly a few months ago, early this year, but I think most observers would attribute that to the internal dynamics that were playing themselves out of succession, uh, with Kim Jong-il uh, feeling his mortality creeping up on him, not having a line of succession that had much credibility, trying to keep the military in its box and just generally uh, being anxious to, to demonstrate a, a heavy load of testosterone. And I think all of that contributed to um, the, you know, the, the thumbing the nose at the West. But now there are some signs that um, you know, serious guarantees of non-regime change, military type incursion, serious economic incentives, and a bit of patience uh, will, uh, will finally get us there. But it's going to be a pretty bumpy road. A fairly simple question. Given, as you say, you can't uninvent what all has already been created, how do you actually destroy nuclear weapons without further endangering the planet? Is there, is there something obvious that I've missed? Or? Um, no, you can actually destroy them um, systematically. I mean, it's a very, very costly process. It's quite a slow process at the moment. It's only taking place um, at the rate of about 350 or so a year on the part of the US, 450 or so on the part of the, the Russians, and there's quite a stock of, of weapons about which there was agreement in those early post-Cold War years to, to wind down, uh, but which hasn't yet been accomplished. But what you've got to do, I mean, you've just got to chop them up very carefully, take out the, um, the, um, the um, fissile components, and then put them into you know, storage in exactly the same way as you have to... Um, you know, put any other fissile material. There is a way of diluting, diluting the, the fissile quality so there's no longer weapons grade, it comes back, uh, the isotopic structure changes and, come, and can be made to come back to just ordinary weapons grade. In fact, quite a large chunk of the, um, the fissile material, the plutonium and the, uh, the enriched uranium, that's come out of uh, dismantled, destroyed Russian weapons pursuant to the post-Cold War agreement between Russia and the United States has actually found its way back to the United States. And you have the glorious irony that uh, US, uh, Russian nuclear weapons have been, uh, have been uh, heating and lighting quite a number of American cities now you know, for some years, which just shows you the world's a slightly more complicated place than uh, sometimes uh, others make out. No, it's, 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 a, it's a technical problem. It's the normal sort of, you know, safe handling materials problem, but it's a perfectly doable problem, resolvable problem. Over this side. Thank you, Professor Evans. Yeah, that's a, jangles the nerves a bit, that description, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. Honorary Professor Evans. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm, not costing, I'm not costing Melbourne University anything. I want to make that clear. Yes, I am an honorary professor. Very important in the present environment. I think it is the case that the UK has decided to renew their nuclear submarine-based nuclear weapons. Is that the case? Not quite. Not quite. But the impression I had is there's strong momentum to do so, and yet we have four hard-nosed Cold War warriors, Henry and his buddies, saying, why would you bother? And we've got our touchy-feely mates, third-way mates, Tony and... Gordon saying it's a good idea. Yeah. Could you please explain to me your empathetic impression mm. of the economic, political, dare I say, yeah. military, strategic and ethical calculus that leads them to renew? Is it all about prestige? Of all the, um, of all the nuclear armed states at the moment, I think the UK is the country that's least wedded to them and would be certainly if Gordon Brown's administration were to continue in office, which does not seem all that fantastically likely, uh, would, be, would be something that would be not impossible to achieve. At the moment, what the, uh, the UK capability of these Trident missiles um, attached to particular submarines which are nearing the end of their useful life, and the issue, the issue is not the missiles, the Trident missiles themselves, but the submarines on which they're, they're carried. And the question is, uh, will they embark upon a very, very expensive replacement program for submarines that could be, frankly, used for nothing else, or will they uh, you know, somehow duck and weave? At the moment, they're ducking and weaving. Uh, they have they made the decision, um, communicated in Parliament uh, a year or so ago, that yes, the Trident submarine replacement uh, program would proceed. But what they've actually done is put it on the back burner, so they're not actually spending any money on design or anything else at the moment and have effectively deferred that decision for another four years or so. So if the momentum of disarmament really builds up, I think um, you could find the UK being prepared to get out in front, and I certainly hope they do. 
the constraining factor will again be, I'm afraid, testosterone. And in the context of the, the perceived role that nuclear weapons have disgracefully had as, a, as an indicator of great power status, and the P5 in particular, the permanent UN5, France is absolutely, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say obsessed on that particular subject, and France is probably the least enthusiastic of any of the nuclear um, states about contemplating a world absolutely free of nuclear weapons, although, to be absolutely fair, France has placed a lot of discipline on its existing structures and systems and has wound back the numbers and got rid of reprocessing facilities and so on, but actually getting rid of them, mm -mm, they're not very keen about that. And I think UK would be worried that yet another sign of its diminishing stature in the world would be self-evident and uh, you know, they'd be reluctant to do it. And the politics of that would, of course, come into play. And I think that's probably the way that the Tories are thinking. But it's not the way Gordon Brown is thinking. Gordon Brown is, is quite passionate on this subject. I know because I've, I've talked to him and I've talked to his staff about it. And he is, is one of the great supporters um, of making this sort of forward movement. And he and Obama are, are quite close on this issue. Anyone else? Yeah, at the back, over there. Uh, thank you, Gareth. Um, that speech was uh, inspiring me to get the last six weeks of my thesis finished on uh, strategic nuclear competition between India and Pakistan. Go for it. My question um, relates to we you touched on extended deterrence, and I see a lot of positive momentum going forward with the uh, challenge of nuclear disarmament. The one area that I have a concern on is uh, ballistic missile uh, defence. Um, we've seen the, the dissolution of the 72 ABM treaty, uh, we're seeing some sort of horizontal proliferation in ballistic missile technology growth with India, Pakistan, DPRK. Yeah. I was just wanting to get your, your view on that. Uh, the yeah. US has obviously got their proposed shield in Poland and Czech Republic. What are your views? Yeah, this is one of the many complications which I didn't plunge into, but I'm acutely, and the Commission's acutely conscious of it. There is no doubt that even if we get through the first round of Russia-US negotiations, any subsequent round is going to be very much hostage to the future of ballistic missile defence. I think the, uh, the Czech and Polish deployments are effectively frozen and effectively, whoops, going to be taken off the table uh, in the, um, the period of this negotiation. Uh, but for the future, you've got this interesting reality that Russia now regards uh, the real problem has been US conventional capability and um, together with the impact of the potential technological effectiveness of the ballistic missile defence. It really does reduce, in Russian eyes, uh, the quality and utility of the armoury that it has. And it, it, it's affecting very much its, um, its, its calculation as to how to conduct these negotiations. We're also getting that very strongly from China. Um, it's the BMD uh, issue is really back on the agenda now in a way that hasn't been for 20 or more years and also the accompanying issue of conventional um, imbalances. I think um, theatre missile defence is a separate issue, the, the, the small theatre environment and the ability to you know, ward off Scud missiles and so on coming into Israel and places, that's, that's one issue. But the, the way in which national ballistic missile defence can, can change the whole strategic calculation by making much less survivable, um, or you know, reducing the effectiveness of any kind of retaliatory capability when you're facing a ballistic missile shield, it changes the calculation. It starts getting people back into arms race mode, which is exactly why the anti-ballistic missile treaty was negotiated in the first place. It sort of it was remarkable the complacency and the, the lack of attention that got when uh, when the Bush administration tore it up and and everybody else went along for the ride. But there's a real focus now back on thinking again about what all this means. And I think, um, and my commission is wrestling with this at the moment, I think there has to be a rethinking about um, building in some more, some more constraints. It's going to be a very, very important element in the equation. A couple more and then we'll, then we'll wind up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Evans, for a very lucid uh, presentation of the scene so far. Um, with, with almost weekly bulletins uh, charting the advance of Iran toward nuclear weapons capability, uh, even short of actually producing fissile material of the quality required or a test, um, it seems to be on the way to introducing a dynamic into the Israel versus the, the rest of the Middle East equation, and we already have Pakistan versus India. What dynamic do you see uh, working through to get nuclear disarmament in those two regions, uh, which seem to be very different from the dynamic you've been talking about vis-a-vis -vis the US and Russia? 
Well, a very good question and demanding much more time. We've got to work our way through the issues, but clearly I think you can talk about minimising nuclear weapons, but eliminating them entirely is going to depend upon ultimately getting confidence in the resolution of these regional problems such that states don't feel they have to, even if it's only psychological more than military reality, hang on to these weapons as a last resort protection against, uh, against the neighbours. And I think that's one of the, these regional problems, one of the many reasons why it's just so impossible to set an end date. Uh, in terms of the, um, for actual abolition, in terms of the specifics of the, um, the Iranian situation, this is an issue that I've been actually quite close to. I've been in Tehran myself recently, it's 18 months or so ago, I've spoken to the key negotiators, Jalili and Larajani and the Foreign Minister and, and Foreign Ministerial officials wearing my crisis group hat and I've had a lot of conversations with senior US and European policy makers. My view, and of course it's all been complicated by the political horrors of the last few months and you know that's shaken everybody in terms of the judgments they make about who's who and how the zoo is going to play out, but my view remains that a doable deal can be done with Iran and it would, be try, it would be catastrophic to try and resolve this by, by military means. And the essence of that doable deal is to take a very deep breath, so far as the West is concerned, and indeed so far as Israel is concerned, and say, OK, Iranian fissile material production is a reality. OK, Iran breakout potential is a reality. These guys have probably got the technological capability, they've probably got enough fissile material to make nuclear weapons if they wanted to. But it absolutely does not follow from that that they are determined to make weapons, or they will make weapons, or that it's impossible to stop them, or that they can be negotiated from doing so. I think it's perfectly possible. There's a big red line there. Because after all, ma making fissile material and having the technological capability to make weapons is something that's not illegal as a matter of international law. It's something you can do under the NPT, as Iran never stops uh, telling people. Uh, the problem is they've been a bit shady about the way in which they've done some of their planning and preparation, less than honest, less than transparent, and with a president that goes around uh, you know, spouting the, the evil nonsense that he does, it doesn't do much to add to people's confidence in your sincerity. But if you work your way through, as I have in many, many conversations with these guys, my view is that they have made actually a cost-benefit calculation, uh, that they get all the benefits they need from being seen to be staring the, the rest of the world down, uh, it serves their status, their Mossadegh humiliation syndrome needs, all of that history. Um, it demonstrates their capability. It gives them something to strut about in the region, but it doesn't expose them to a whole bunch of very serious risks. The risks that they would be zapped by the Israelis if they did cross that line and got an actual weapon, I think the Israelis can probably take a deep breath and stop short of a preemptive assault because of the catastrophic things that would flow from that, but the Israelis are not going to stop if the Iranians actually acquire a weapon because one or two weapons could, could wipe the country out. I think the Iranians are very conscious of that and for that reason alone would probably not cross the line. I think there's also the fact that the Iranians would know they'd run out of support instantly overnight uh, from Russia and China if they went down that path. They know that they would not enjoy regional hegemony for very long because Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Turkey would always all want to get into the act. They know that the whole world, and that's partly the Russia-China thing, would be on their backs with sanctions in a way that simply hasn't been very effective so far. And all these factors come into play. Now, none of this means that you could trust um, the Iranians to you know, stick to any deal without very, very intensive monitoring and verification. That has to be part of any negotiation. But when you put all those pieces together, incentives, disincentives, recognise the reality that they're not going to move, I think, on the fissile material thing, uh, and then get a monitoring regime in place which gives us some confidence we, we can know what's going on in the future. And when you think about the cost-benefit calculations they've, probably, they've already made, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a solvable problem. Uh, my worry is that you know, such will be the, the volatility and explosiveness of this issue you know, for the Israelis, that you know, something, uh, something will happen sooner rather than later, you know, before the Iranians are demonstrated to have any weapon, and then the whole balloon will go up, and then it's putting that lot together again is going to be impossible. But sorry, I mean, we could go off and we could explore the dynamics of India-Pakistan, we could talk about you know, the Middle East peace process and how that feeds into this, but I mean, that's, that's the... That's the short take on where we're going on that issue. It is doable. The deal is doable, and I think it's time that it was done. I think Obama senses that, the US administration senses it, uh, but the politics of it have become very much harder as a result of uh, the goings-on in the last few months. John, I think that's probably about it.
Um, okay, it is. Thank you. Well, <laughs> oh God.